Well, it's now been over six years since the start of the Me Too movement, which saw women denounce and chip away at elements of misogyny worldwide. From the United States and Europe to several parts of Asian and Asia and Latin America. Uh, but what about the African continent? Between accusations that Me Too was largely Western centric to claims that fear of backlash silenced African women, the movement arguably had a slower impact across the continent. Well, my guest today, Fatou Jallo, who publicly accused the former Gambian president of rape, is credited with changing that. And she joins me uh, now on set. Fatou, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Uh, so no rape accusations, obviously, should ever be, be taken lightly. All of them are, are equally as serious. But yours is particularly disturbing because it concerns uh, a former president. Can you tell us more about your story? Uh, my story is not a unique story. It's it's the story of so many women um, around the continent and around the world in general uh, having powerful men abuse their power. And especially in my case, this was a dictatorship. I grew up in it. Um, the man came to power the same year I was born. Um, we know nothing but him, you know. You see him on your screens and it's all you learn about and all is great. You are never certain of the atrocities that are happening. You are never aware that you're living in a dictatorship dictatorship because it looks glorious and everyone celebrates it, so everything is okay. I became his victim after he organized a beauty pageant, which is supposed to be a scholarship pageant for brilliant young women around the country to be able to go anywhere in the world and study and come and serve their country. And in hopes of that and my family, I participated proudly. Uh, but instead of that happening, the president at the time who ruled for decades uh, decided to insert his power proposed marriage, which I refused, not because I knew or I knew what I wanted, I just did, knew what I did not want, and that is to be a teenage wife to the most powerful man in my country. And a man so powerful who couldn't accept no financer decided to rape me. I flee my country. I was a refugee for a very long time. I finally settled in Canada and I spoke out publicly in 2019. So you, you fled the country, as you said, but did, what was the reaction like in, in Gambia? Did people believe you? Were they supportive? Um, again, that is a shared story and a common feeling and experience among a lot of women that find the courage somehow to speak of their experiences. Uh, Gambia has a lot of cultural barriers, a lot of uh, lack of will, politically especially. Um, so it was really a mixed bag, I could say. A lot of women came out to also tell their stories, a lot of young people for the first time, to speak publicly about this outrageous crime that goes unpunished and is unprecedented. And then uh, you had other people that wanted to maintain the state to score. And if we are going to acknowledge that the most powerful person that have ruled our nation is a rapist, then how many more other people would we have to look at and how deeply should we um, um, talk about this situation? So it was, it was difficult. You, you suggested uh, there that it's obviously a much bigger uh, problem, but uh, right. a at least two other people have accused uh, Yahya Jama, the former president, uh, of, of rape, at least Publicly. two other yeah. uh, women. So uh, there were even three weeks of public hearings dedicated to sexual and gender-based uh, violence under his presidency. What came out of those hearings? Were there any consequences for him? That was very important for me, especially uh, after coming out and speaking out in 2019. Um, there was a national truth and reconciliation Commission that was focused on Jamis crimes of arbitrary arrest and detaining uh, political opponents and murdering people in broad daylight in numbers. Um, and I thought central to that, if we were going to be a nation that was serious about women's rights and the violations that occurred not only within the presidency but in prisons and also outside of that, it was important to have a special session dedicated to that. And I was willing to participate in that because it's important to document these things. If we are going to hold people like Jame accountable for political crimes, uh, it is important to also hold him accountable for human rights violations, especially against women. Um, it lets us know where we are as a nation when it comes to how seriously we take violence against women. Um, it's been awesome in the sense that having the Truth Commission talk about and have witnesses come forward and testify about their different experiences, whether they're political prisoners, whether they were private citizens or people that work 
worked for the government. Uh, these were documented. Unfortunately, part of the new government's recommendations is to include that Jam may be prosecuted for violations against women, especially rape. And that is a huge, huge win uh, for the movement as a whole. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Me Too uh, more, more generally. Do you think there is an African Me Too movement to speak of? Has uh, the movement brought any major changes, in your view, either in Gambia, the country that you, you, you know, uh, or elsewhere on the continent? Um... Tricky, because I feel like African women and feminists and have been screaming stories of Muay Too for a very, very, very long time. And the fact that attention has been brought to it when this Western part of the world, especially Hollywood, came to the center of it, tells you a lot about the stories we prioritize. Um, African women speaking up against uh, uh, systematic oppression of women and abuse of power by men who are in this powerful positions have been a conversation for a very long time. Uh, we are pleased that the conversation is getting a bit more broadened and had attention, especially in 2019. But I think the conversation now should be about sustainability, sustaining those voices, and to think about how broadly Me Too can affect the voices of young women all around the continent whose rapists are not presidents or media moguls or producers or people we deem important enough to give media coverage to. I think to expand Me Too to more grassroots movements and to have young women and vulnerable communities empowered around the world is the only way to sustain the Me Too conversation. If not, we are going to wait again for the next powerful moment and for the next powerful person to abuse another young girl or another woman in order for us to give any kind of attention to this conversation. So what factors uh, do, you, do you think prevented the movement from having as much as an impact as it did in the West and perhaps as, as a follow-up connected question? Uh, what do you make of the criticism that Me Too is for white women? Do you see it as Western or do you think it can be more univer universal? I think the world is a bit too diverse for us to be, for us to be able to box those things separately. Uh, what I've really talked about in my book in, uh, is... is centers around this. When I told my story in 2019, when I came out, I found myself a little all over the place with people trying to box me in one of two or two of these boxes. Uh, people, especially from the Gambia, telling me that I wasn't Gambian enough, I wasn't cultured enough, I wasn't a proud African enough, because an African woman will not speak so brazenly about violence and rape. And then having the other side, the Western world, trying to portray this image that if only I had not landed my feet in Canada and got rescued and became a refugee, I would have never found my voice. I I believe that there is a bridge between these two world, uh, worlds, actually, and uh, that is, yes, like my feminist activism came from seeing a lot of other women who portrayed and, and, and showed what it means to be resilient as a woman in a patriarchy that is deepened and, and, and supported institutionally and, and culturally, and still... They rose in ways that are unimaginable. They went to schools and they defeated the patriarchy in the ways that they can. And that is why I am here today. And that is why I said no the first time I said no to the most powerful man being 18, 19 and did not even know the, the, the implications of, of, of my saying no. And then... It is also true that I did find myself in this part of the world where I have learned that we can be more. I think we should be thinking about how to bridge this gap and how to see Western feminism as the same as African feminism, but also to acknowledge the roots of it, the history of women's resistance and minority groups around the world. And none of this is new. And to refuse the rebranding of feminism as a Western ideology, I think it takes away from from our grandparents and our great-grandparents who fought tooth and nail to be where we are today, where we no longer bury young girls because they are girls, and we are fighting against FGM and all other violations against women's rights. Fatu Jalo, uh, thank you. Uh, Tufa Jalo, excuse me. Thank you so nice. much uh, for coming on the show today. As a reminder to our viewers, her book, uh, Tufa, The Woman Who, Infire, Who Inspired an African Me Too Movement, was published in 2020. She's here in Paris now for the book being published in French. Thank you.